is Janet Hill of the Rock Island County Health Department. Welcome to our briefing of September 1st, 2020. Uh, today we have with us Dr. Louis Katz, the Medical Director of the Scott County Health Department, um, Ed Rivers, the Director of the Scott County Health Department, and Nita Ludwig, the Administrator of the Rock Island County Health Department. Thank you all for joining us. Nita, let's start off with Rock Island County's case count, please. Good afternoon. Unfortunately, today, Rock Island County is reporting three additional deaths from COVID-19, a woman in her 60s, a woman in her 80s, and a man in his 70s. All three had been living in long-term care facilities, and the total number of deaths in Rock Island County is now at 63. We, are, we send our deepest condolences to the family and friends of these individuals. We know of at least 31 COVID-19 patients who have died in August, including the three today. In addition, we also have 19 additional new cases of COVID-19, and uh, I was looking for the total, and that brings our total to date to 2,266, and 15 people are currently hospitalized in Rock Island County. For a community to respond to communicable disease such as COVID-19, a number of tools are needed to respond effectively and reduce the spread of illness. These tools include social distancing, wearing a face mask or covering, contact tracing of positive cases, hand washing, quarantining of individuals who are close contacts, isolation of individuals who are positive for COVID-19, and staying home when you show any signs of illness. The reopening of many schools in our community has highlighted the contact tracing process that takes place when a positive case of COVID-19 is identified. We would like to take a moment again to explain the process, the impact it can have on disease spread, and the role of individuals in making this process effective. Contact tracing is used to identify possible spread of disease from a positive individual to any other individuals that they may have close contact with during their infectious period. During a pandemic where virus is spreading throughout the community, called community spread, contact tracing has the goal of preventing further spread of the illness, not pinpointing where someone actually got the virus. Our contact tracers do call all positive cases and the number that they use looks like a Chicago number, but it's really the Rock Island County Health Department. So we wanted to alert them that if they see this number that I will um, give you in just a moment here, that it is not Chicago calling, it is Rock Island County Health Department and to please pick up and answer our contact tracer questions. That number is 312-777-1999. So if you see that number on your phone, 312-777-1999, that is the contact tracer from the Rock Island County Health Department, and please pick up and answer our questions to prevent the spread of this virus. Thank you. In Scott County today, uh, our cases stand at 2,235, and deaths are at 21. Contact tracing follows very similar steps in Scott County. The process started when the local health department receives the positive test result for an individual. This process happens regardless of how the individual may have contracted COVID-19. <clears throat> if you're called by the local health department, please answer or return our call after we leave you a voicemail. Here's what to expect. For positive individuals, you will be asked a series of questions by the health department staff to determine when you would likely have been contagious and who you spent time with during that period to identify who may have been exposed. You will be asked to self-isolate for at least 10 days and will be given advice on how to take care of yourself during self-isolation. And you will be free to ask any questions you might have. For context to a positive case, <clears throat> You'll be told you've been exposed to a positive case of COVID-19. You'll be asked to quarantine yourself for 14 days from your last exposure to the case to make sure you don't spread the virus to others 
in case you develop COVID-19. You'll be given advice on symptoms to watch out for, and you'll also be free to ask any questions you might have. It's not anyone's first choice to have to stay home from work or school for an extended time. However, as community spread of COVID-19 continues, this could happen to any of us. If you find yourself in a situation where you're getting contacted by public health, we simply ask you to do your part. Take our phone call, answer our questions, and follow our guidance. You'll be doing your part to help keep the virus from spreading further. Thank you, Ed and Nita, for that information on contact tracing and the process that's currently taking place. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Katz, Medical Director of the Scott County Health Department. Um, so go ahead and um, give us the information that you have prepared for us today. Thanks, Dr. Katz. Okay, Brooke, are you gonna show that graph? Yes, we will work on showing that right now. Okay, so what we're gonna show you is the Scott County epidemic curve. Um, the Rock Island County curve looks very similar. Um, and and the exact numbers are not critically important. But what you see, the blue bars are the uh, uh, case counts, and the red line is 14-day moving average. And you can see that we had a small peak in April uh, and a big surge uh, beginning in June and continuing to date. We were very hopeful uh, into mid and late August that we were gonna continue downward as we approached the time when school would open. But as you can see, uh, over the past approximately two weeks, uh, we've been on a, a steady upward trend and we're running just under 30 cases per day uh, in the two week moving average. So that's a, a rate or an incidence of approximately 20 cases per 100,000 population per day. To put that in context, uh, the the uh, incidence rates at which people, um, uh, public health officials begin to feel pretty comfortable with a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, learning opportunities in the school would be between one and five cases per 100,000 per day. Uh, so um, I think uh, the rates that we're seeing uh, should uh, make us very cautious as we try to reopen schools over the next several weeks. In addition, we show you the 14-day test positive rate. This is the moving average over 14 days uh, from uh, the Iowa website, 7.4%, which has been rising from about 6% over the last uh, several days. And again, for context, I uh, feel much more comfortable about uh, reopening um, interventions when we get that rate continuously below 5%. So not, not the news we'd like to see, uh, but uh, those are uh, the numbers. I've been asked about the age distribution of cases uh, in Scott County, and we know uh, uh, during August, oh, approximately 13 to 15% uh, of our cases were in the K through 12 age groups, and the rest very widely, widely the, risk, the rest very widely distributed above that age, with um, with a lot of cases in in young adults, um, uh, and increasing number of cases uh, in older adults. Um, I was asked why we put a contact to a confirmed case in uh, quarantine for 14 days, uh, but an actual confirmed case is in isolation for only 10. It's actually fairly simple. The 14-day uh, self-quarantine for contact is from the last day of contact with a positive case and encompasses the longest incubation period for the infection. An individual who's already positive is already on average five or six days into their infection. So uh, doesn't have to stay uh, in isolation quite as long 
uh, as the contact does. Uh, we know that uh, in people who are infected with illness uh, with, uh, uh, and have COVID-19, in fact, the virus has gone from their upper airway probably between day seven and day nine or 10. So, uh, so 10 days of isolation for a case is really uh, all that's needed and, and is reasonably uh, conservative. Um, the other question I was asked was, uh, had to do with why, whether a patient with an individual, excuse me, who has contact with the case is, uh, is quarantined uh, for 14 days, regardless of the use of masks or not. And the reason for that is basically that masks are a form or a, an intervention that we use as harm reduction, not harm elimination. We believe masks are very effective, but they're not completely effective. Uh, so we, uh, public health guidance from both CDC and the state um, uh, asks us to uh, not consider uh, in a contact situation whether masks were being uh, worn. So that's all I had. Thank you, Dr. Katz. We do have a number of questions. I think I'll start with some that are in the chat first, and then we did have some that came up um, prior to the call, but I think those on the chat relate to some of the information you just shared, so we'll go to those first. Um, one question is, who should people believe when it comes to information and statistics? Where should they look for reliable information? So as even the CDC appears to contradict itself sometimes, and people can be frustrated. So what is your suggestion for where individuals should look for information um, related to this so they can make decisions for themselves and their family? Well, they can always reach out to the health department. Uh, and, and it is true, we, we access a lot of information that isn't easily available to the public. So what appears to be contradictory can actually be contradictory, but much more often represents our evolution of understanding. We said something, two weeks ago, but the evidence is evolving so quickly that it changes now. Uh, so uh, I believe that the CDC uh, and uh, the state health department websites are in fact very, very excellent sources of information. When you find them confusing, reach out to us and we'll try and uh, make sense out of uh, the confusion that you're having. Um, there's another question on the chart that you shared, and I'll give a little um, sort of pre-information for this. It's regarding the EpiLinked cases. So um, both health departments do the interviews that come with positive cases, and so there's some additional information that is gathered from that that connects to some cases who may end up um, having symptoms and things like that. Can you give some further explanation about what it means for EpiLinked cases and how that compares to actually the confirmed number of cases in our community? Yeah, we have, uh, in our case counts, which are a little higher than what you get from the state, we include what are called epidemiologically linked or epi-linked individuals. Those are people on whom we don't have a confirmatory test result, but who were uh, contacts of a confirmed case and have symptoms. So it's a very standard approach uh, to um, infectious diseases epidemiology. So, for example, in our STD clinic, if somebody is a contact to a confirmed case of gonorrhea, we treat them and don't wait for a test result to come back. We usually test them, but we don't wait for the test result to come back because, uh, because they're very, very likely to be infected. And it's the same with uh, COVID-19. Uh, if you have symptoms and you were a contact with a case, you're very, very probably going to confirm. Uh, and so we put those people um, uh, into quarantine as epidemiologically or epi-linked cases. Next question would be for Rock Island County, so either Janet or Nita. Um, the information that Dr. Katz shared is based on the data that he has from Scott County and the graph he makes based on that. Um, is there a similar graph that Rock Island County would have and um, 
for both, is there a way that the tracking of deaths over the same period of um, and a 14 day average could be graphed in a similar way? Um, Janet, I'll take this and you can um, add on if you so choose, but we do have some graphs that we have been doing here internally and we could share them. I don't believe they have the rolling average, but they are much the same. And then our metrics are actually on the Illinois Department of Public Health website that can show you the positivity rates for Rock Island County. And as of right now, it is 6.6%, which is down a little bit from the last reporting period, but still higher than we would like to see it. Janet, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I don't. Nita, there's another question for you. It says, unless my data is wrong, about 80% of deaths in Rock Island County are of patients living in long-term care. What could be done differently to protect the elderly, disabled, and most vulnerable? Yes, you, you are very accurate there. Most of our deaths, unfortunately, have been in long-term care facilities. And it is unfortunate because many, many, as you know, many of these patients have lots of underlying health conditions, heart problems, respiratory problems, any, any number of things can make COVID-19 even more serious. Um, and what really can be done is that everybody is practicing the same um, precautions that we've been talking about with the frequent hand washing. Of course, they are using the proper uh, personal protective equipment, and we are still supplying long-term nursing care, long-term care places with the proper PPE from the health department. Um, and the other thing is all of the people that are coming and going out of those facilities, whether it's delivery drivers or healthcare workers or uh, food prep people, they all contribute to, you know, what is happening there. I'm not blaming anyone, but the, everyone needs to kind of take into consideration where they do on their off time. So are they attending large gatherings? Are they uh, interacting with people who may or may not have the virus? Really, people need to be thinking about that and taking that into consideration when they go out places, because as we all know, there can be people that are symptomatic and still not know that they have the virus and then maybe go to work and spread it totally, you know, unintentionally to this vulnerable population. Um, next question, I'll have Dr. Katz answer this. Do you have any idea how many positive test results may be duplicates or from the same patient? And perhaps you can also speak to um, the amount of time someone could potentially test positive um, regarding antibodies and things like that. Yeah, um, we don't have duplicates uh, in our spreadsheet. We uh, um, uh, have enough quality control to make sure that we're weeding out uh, anything that's uh, that's a duplicate. Those are um, uh, all uh, uh, individual patients are only counted once uh, at this point. Um, the uh, Duration that people can test positive is a really fascinating question, and it's too bad we don't have enough time to go into a lot of detail. The test that we use called nucleic acid amplification to confirm cases uh, turns positive, generally speaking, um, in a time frame of probably um, oh anywhere from four to six or seven days after the exposure. That is, the virus has to grow enough in the airway uh, to have enough there to be detectable. We detect not the virus, but we detect a short fragment of its genetic material, uh, not the live virus. So that test stays positive uh, for many, many, many days uh, after the virus itself is no longer viable. And there are actually reports that the that that PCR test that we use can stay positive uh, even for as long as two to three or four months uh, in the noses of a few patients. Usually, it's gone by the third or fourth week uh, of infection. Antibodies 
come up in people who are symptomatic, antibodies become detectable. That is the immune response to the virus as opposed to the virus. The immune response to the virus becomes detectable uh, generally at the end of the first week of infection. Probably by then, oh, half or 60% of people will have antibodies that can be measured with a good test. Those antibodies then peak at about uh, four weeks after infection. And depending on which antibody you're measuring, they appear to persist for months, but do decline uh, slowly after reaching that peak at the end of the first month after infection or into the second and third month. Uh, depending on which antibody, what kind of antibody you measure, uh, I suspect that we'll find that some antibodies persist for many, many months. Ed, we have a couple questions here for you that we could have you address. Um, are individuals that test positive and are asymptomatic being asked to quarantine? Absolutely. We believe that, that, that asymptomatic individuals who shed the virus um, are probably responsible for between 30 and 50% of transmissions, the people who are either asymptomatic the entire course of their infection or haven't yet developed symptoms but are shedding virus. Uh, when people get sick, so let's say that you were exposed a week ago and you get sick today, you were probably shedding enough virus to infect people for 48 and even 72 hours before your first symptoms. So two to three days before illness develops, people can be uh, transmitting. And people who never develop symptoms can probably transmit for a total of somewhere in the range of uh, even up to nine or 10 days. Well, it's one of the other questions. We know that epi-linked cases are sort of a presumptive way to see the spread of um, disease in the community and that some of those epi-linked cases may eventually be confirmed cases. Um, but do you have an idea at this point of what percentage of cases are epi-linked versus confirmed? I think about 10% of our cases are epi-linked, maybe a little lower than that. I think it's a little lower than that. It's not a big chunk, but it's, it's not trivial. Ed, we have a question here for you regarding some stats on the Iowa Department of Public Health website. What can we learn from the antigen stats that are now showing up on the state website? I'm gonna to defer to Dr. Katz on that one. Oh, okay. Well, instead of detecting the nucleic acid, the genetic material of the virus, antigen tests uh, detect proteins from the virus. And unlike the nucleic acid te test, they don't amplify the target that we're trying to detect. So they're less sensitive. That is, they're less likely to be positive than somebody who's infected, but they're pretty good tests. Particularly in people with symptoms, they're, they're really reasonably sensitive. They're okay. Uh, and they also have a few more false positives, many more false positives than the nucleic acid test. But they're rapid, they're relatively cheap, and, and can be used quite effectively, particularly in patients and in individuals who have symptoms. So as you're talking about that type of test and the nucleic acid, if you're not testing for the live virus, but for a fragment of material, what fragment are you testing for? Well, it's a stretch of the genetic material of the virus. The, the virus has 29,000 bases in its genetic material, its genome, chromosome. And we detect a stretch that I believe is about 20 bases long. Very tiny fragment, but it's very, very highly conserved in the virus. So, so we don't miss very many with it. The misses that we see with nucleic acid testing are related to two things. One, testing too early or too late so that there's very little virus left. Uh, and the other is a poor sampling technique. 
you've all seen pictures and some of you have probably been tested. The standard approach is to stick a swab all the way uh, from your nose all the way back to your throat. It's very uncomfortable uh, and it takes highly trained people to do it properly. So if you don't get a good sample, you may miss the virus as well. Uh, and, uh, but nucleic acid tests are very, very sensitive. That is, they don't miss very many when done properly and extremely specific. That means when they're positive, they're true positive. They're not false positives. So uh, nucleic acid testing is really the best way um, uh, to confirm cases. Okay, and then we do have a couple of questions that came prior that are not in the chat. And so um, this could be for Dr. Katz or for Ed. Um, White House experts are warning Iowa leaders that the state has the country's steepest coronavirus outbreak and that the state should close bars in 61 counties and test all returning college students for the virus. Why is Iowa seeing such a spike? Ed? <laughs> Well, if you'll recall back during the uh, period from March through uh, the early part of June, uh, there were restrictions on restaurants and uh, bars and other uh, public gathering places. And it was shortly after those restrictions were lifted that we saw our July peak. Um, the effectiveness of our measures in preventing this disease rely totally on the individual. As long as the individuals follow the advice that the local health departments give them, uh, they should remain relatively safe from the virus. But it's clear uh, that over the summer that discipline is eroded uh, and hence we've had the July peak and now the increasing numbers uh, in August and early September. Um, and another question was related to a mask mandate and um, the ability to implement that statewide. Um, while we obviously don't have control of that, any um, information you want to share on either of that? Well, what we've been told uh, by the governor and the attorney general of the state of Iowa is that local jurisdictions cannot pass any measures more stringent than are in the governor's uh, dis, uh, declaration of disaster emergency. So that means no local mask mandates um, because they're not enforceable. Some jurisdictions have passed them and have said that they will enforce them, um, but I haven't heard of any actual enforcement activity and likely any uh, penalties that were uh, intended to be imposed would not make it through a court of law. Dr. Katz, would you like to take a minute and just talk a little bit more about um, the role of masks and the benefit of masks in slowing transmission? I know we've been talking about them specifically within school settings as well as in any indoor areas or where people can't social distance. Can you um, just give a better description of how um, that works? Well, they work two ways. The relative contribution of the two ways is not 100% clear, but but they work in two ways. One is source control. That is, um, if you're infected and expelling droplets when you talk and breathe and shout and sing or cough and sneeze, they stop a large proportion of the potentially infectious droplets. They don't get out to where they can infect another person, either directly or by contaminating the inanimate environment. Um, the kind of masks that the, most of the public use, cloth masks, are not thought to be as effective as surgical and N95 uh, healthcare per, personal protective equipment in protecting an individual from becoming infected as opposed to source control. But they do offer some uh, protection uh, um, uh, uh, from becoming infected. So it's both ways. I suspect source control is more important uh, than, than protecting the individual wearing the mask, but both are important uh, and they're highly effective. I believe on this media call several weeks ago, I pointed to a study in the CDC's weekly journal, MMWR, 
uh, two um, uh, salon workers in Springfield, Missouri, who were both symptomatic with COVID-19, and over 14 days during which both of those salon workers and all of their clients uh, wore masks, uh, nobody became infected. And that was 139 contacts uh, that were studied that averaged 15 minutes each. Masks are highly effective. They aren't perfect, but they're highly effective. And they are one of the single best uh, methods for harm reduction uh, that we have. The interesting thing about the mandates, there are 31 states with statewide mandates. And the level of enforcement that's being done is very highly variable. Uh, but most places don't have mask police who are going around writing tickets. But what happens with the mask mandate is then from top to bottom in society, uh, there's modeling of safest and most appropriate behavior. And the states that have mask mandates see that compliance with mask use goes up very sharply uh, when the mandates are in place and critically when all of the leadership in government, public health, and influencers all, are all seen to be wearing masks. It becomes appropriate behavior, and even absent writing tickets for not wearing masks, they're temporarily associated with excellent um, outcomes. Okay, um, we did have one follow-up question on the nucleic acid test. Is that a nasal pharyngeal test or not? It can be done on a nasal pharyngeal sample. That is the deep swab that goes all the way back to the throat through the nose. It can be done on a nasal sample that's a little less deep, probably a little less sensitive, a little bit, a little bit less likely to pick up a true infection. And there's expanding evidence that tests on uh, saliva and throat swabs can be quite good as well. And they take much less training to do, obviously no training to spit in a cup and a throat swab can be done by a relatively untrained person. Uh, so however you try to do it, there are trade-offs dependent on the source of the specimen and the method used. Uh, but we make those trade-offs all the time. The simplicity of a salivary specimen, for example, can allow widespread uh, sampling in schools uh, to detect spread of the virus before it gets out of control, for example. Uh, so um, uh, everything's dependent on the population you're testing, how much infection you expect there is, how much sensitivity you demand from the test, all kinds of things that determine how, how you choose a method. Question here for you as well. What is the cycle threshold of the PCR test being used in Scott County? We know it's private providers who are doing this, but do you have an indication of what that might be? Well, there are many different tests being done, but there are almost mostly, but not all, what are called RT-PCR, which is the uh, the method that has a cycle threshold. So the way that nucleic acid amplification works is that in successive chemical cycles, we multiply the amount of the virus by two. We double the amount of virus in each cycle so that when you get up to cycle thresholds of 18 and 20, um, you have a lot of virus there. So think of two to the 18th. Isn't a huge number in terms of the number of viruses that might be present. When you get the higher cycle thresholds, like 10 to the 30, uh, like 35 or 40, it, it has taken 35 or 40 doubling cycles to have enough uh, virus to detect it. It means there's very little virus there. Each test by each manufacturer uh, submits it has data submitted to the Food and Drug Administration for its approval and specifies a cycle threshold uh, based on the developmental work that's been done by the company 
as they brought the assay forward. So they vary a little bit from um, from manufacturer to manufacturer. In general, I can tell you that the uh, that the cycle threshold at which a test is called positive, in general, is in the range of 35, 36, 37, or lower for most of the assays that are out there. We don't um, we don't routinely get cycle threshold data when we get positive uh, test reports, um, uh, mainly because most of the assays. In fact, their licensure emergency use authorization does not allow a quantitative claim, so the laboratories are not allowed to report that information. Dr. Katz, I know earlier on in the pandemic you were talking quite a bit of um, some of the undetected prevalence or what we believe the actual infection rate is in the community. Do you have an indication of what that could possibly be or what's the um, general consensus for how to estimate that? Well, I, that, those estimates haven't really changed since April and May, uh, early June. And we believe that it's on the high side of five to 10 times as many cases uh, as we count are out there. So, so if we're seeing 20 cases a day, uh, 20 cases or 25 cases per 100,000 per day, there's probably somewhere in the range of 50 to 200 or so. There's a lot more than what we find uh, with testing and contact tracing. And is there a reason to believe that mortality rates or mortality statistics, would there also be a larger prevalence of that compared to what we know of? Well, death is a hard endpoint. It's hard to miss. So we, we think that any underreporting in deaths relates to uh, a couple of factors. Uh, one is that cause of death is a very crude uh, epidemiologic statistic. So if somebody gets COVID-19 who has heart disease and then has a heart attack, they may, be, may get called uh, a cardiovascular death, not a COVID death. Uh, or uh, if somebody dies at home and doesn't get an autopsy, uh, uh, the diagnosis may be missed. There are a million reasons for miscoding a death. One of the metrics that we look at for influenza every year and are looking at very hard for COVID now is what's called excess deaths. So you look at the average number of deaths in a time frame, let's say from March through August, for five years previous to 2020, and you look at the deaths from March through August this year, and we'll find excess deaths. And a large proportion, proportion of those excess deaths will be attributable directly or indirectly to the impact of the pandemic. So there's the cases of COVID-19 that don't get counted, and there are the deaths of people who, for example, don't seek care for important medical problems because they're afraid to go to the hospital uh, that contribute to those kinds of excess deaths. Uh, and at the end of the day, what I want to know uh, is in this stretch of time in 2020, how many more people died than we would have expected in a non-COVID year, and we use that excess death parameter to uh, estimate that. It's not perfect, but it's very good, and it's been very, very important and useful for decades as we study influenza uh, annually. Um, there's a lot of delay in reporting cause of death and whatnot, so it's always a lagging indicator. Um, a lot of death certificates don't get done for weeks and weeks, uh, after a death occurs, um, and and determining cause of death without an autopsy is often very difficult. But it's a good measure. Uh, it's mostly a good measure retrospectively. Six months down the line, we'll have a very good estimate of excess deaths. Right now, not as good. 
Okay, so the last question of today's briefing will just be related to treatments and therapies that doctors are now using, and are they working to reduce symptoms and help to prevent death? Is that for me? Yes, it is. <laughs> Isn't there another doctor on this call? Um, so death rates from COVID uh, have fallen over the um, almost six months of the pandemic in the U.S. Unfortunately, not much of that fall in the death rate is related to uh, things that we do specifically to attack the virus. Uh, things like the antiviral drug remdesivir, things like convalescent plasma that were very actively uh, involved in um, manufacturing and distributing at uh, Mississippi Valley Regional Blood Center, uh, the use of uh, dexamethasone uh, for uh, people in intensive care uh, do save some lives. Most of the improvement comes from learning about the disease and learning how to support patients more safely and effectively as their immune systems eliminate the infection and allow them to heal. So things like how to avoid putting people on ventilators, mechanical ventilators, which have, has its own set of very serious uh, complications. Uh, things as simple as how to position a patient when they're on a ventilator. Uh, the importance of abnormal blood clotting in bad outcomes from COVID-19 has emerged over the last several months. And the uses of approaches to prevent abnormal blood clotting have been very, very important. So the falling death rate is a combination of the specific treatments we're trying to mobilize, but is heavily influenced by learning about the disease and knowing how best and most safely to support patients when they get sick. Dr. Katz, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you sharing your wealth of information um, with the community as well as with us as we continue to provide guidance to all of the different sectors in our community and support individuals and families as they're making important decisions for themselves and their families. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our media partners. This call is being recorded and will be posted to the Scott County Health Department's website as well as our social media pages. So should you need to um, track back to the, any of the information that was shared, you may find it there. Again, thank you for joining us and we look forward to sharing additional information with you in the upcoming days. Have a good afternoon.